What's up guys? Today we're going to be talking all about the Axis powers. Hopefully it surprises none of you that the Axis powers consist of Germany, Italy, and Japan. So in this video I'm going to be giving a brief overview of all three of the Axis powers. And these overviews are going to include an overview of their economies and how their income works, as well as a brief overview of how each of their diplomacy actions work. Just a spoiler, that's going to be mostly Germany. Italy and Japan don't do much in terms of diplomacy. So with that said, I'm going to save the big in for last. So we'll start with Japan, head on over to Italy, and then finish up with Germany. All right, let's go. Before we get to talking about any diplomacy in this game, I need to clarify an important concept for you guys. And that's going to be the difference between alignment and control of minor powers in this game. Now to explain this very important concept, I'm going to set up a demonstration for you here. So in this demonstration, we have just hit July of 1939 and Russia can make its attacks on neutral powers for the first time in the game. Now, Germany has not declared war on Russia. Russia has not declared war on Germany. They are at peace currently. So, if Russia were to declare war on Iran, come in here and take Azerbaijan, because it's empty and free, and do nothing else on their turn, that would cause Iran to become a controlled minor of Germany. Which means, on Germany's turn, during its attack phase, the German player can control these Iranian infantry here, do whatever they want with them. They could drop one back here, to defend southern Iran if they want. They could also attack within Iran if they would like because Iran is at war with the Soviet Union. I mean, shit, you could probably attack Turkmenistan if you wanted to, too. I don't know why you do that, but you could. So, another thing that comes with being a controlled miner is you get a recruitment role. So, in this hypothetical scenario, on Germany's next turn, Iran has two owned land territories. That means you're going to roll this d12, and if you hit a 2, or less, a 1, there it is. If you hit a 1 or a 2, you get either 2 militia or 1 infantry to place anywhere you want in Iran. So that means Russia has got to be careful when attacking Iran. You know, it's probably a good idea to take out both these two t uh, territories so that the German player only hits on a one with their recruitment role of Iran. And so those are the stipulations of being a controlled miner. Now, Iran will stay a controlled miner of Germany until a point in the game when Russia and Germany go to war. At which point, as soon as the controlling power of Iran, in this case Germany, is at war with the same major power that Iran is at, in this case the Soviet Union, Iran aligns to Germany and becomes a full German territory. Like so. And so now that Iran is a full German territory, it no longer functions as a controlled miner and therefore does not get recruitment roles anymore. It is just a part of Germany and will be treated as a part of full Germany. Meaning you can build militia here, you can build two militia in southern Iran and one in northern Iran. But that's about the only way that you can reinforce it. So just for a quick reiteration. Russia attacks Iran, but Russia is not at war with Iran's controlling power, which in this case is Germany. And will always be Germany when Russia attacks a minor. So until Russia and Germany are at war, Iran is a controlled miner of Germany. And Germany controls Iranian units on their turn and does a recruitment role at the end of their turn. And then once Germany is fully at war with Russia, these territories become German. And that's that. That's the difference between a controlled miner and an aligned territory. All right. 
Let's move on with the talk about Japan. Okay, let's start off here with the Japanese reference sheet. This is going to be super important to read through on your own. I'm just going to briefly cover each of the important topics here. Starting with the Japanese income, as you can see, it starts at its full IPP value of all the land zones. That's going to be the same for all three axis powers. Uh, this chart is going to be a lot more important for the common turn and the allied powers. So I'm going to go over this in more detail in those videos. And be sure to look at this Japanese overview to see important stuff. I'm going to go over all this in a second using the, the board uh, as a, more of a visualization because I find it easier to learn that way. Uh, make sure you're really familiar with the victory objectives. I'm not going to go over those in this game. I'm going to leave those for you to decide how you want to handle, but make sure you read these really, really well. Also, your wartime bonus income is going to be important. Again, I'm not going to go over that in this video. This is just more of a dip diplomatic video and kind of the ins and outs of Japan. I'm going to let you read these on your own and figure out how you want to handle that. This is important to remember and easy to forget. Um, at the beginning of the game, you have plus three income because of American oil trade, and you're going to lose that over time, so be sure to really read this. And again, this is a diplomatic video, so I'm not going to cover the Japanese special abilities very much, but please, please read these very well. They are all super important, especially these destroyer transports, because that's an awesome, awesome unit for you. And this surprise attack could be huge in the early game if you catch your allied friends sleeping. One other thing that is important to note about the Japanese, I've already mentioned they have special destroyers that can carry infantry class units. They also have a special infantry class unit called the Special Naval Landing Force, which is basically just an elite marine. Remember those guys, they're going to be important. All right, let's move over to the board. Okay, now the political situation in Japan is probably one of the most simple in the game, if not the most simple in the game. Japan starts the game at peace with everybody, not at war, but Japan can declare war on anybody in the game except for its allies, the Germans and the Italians. That means you can declare war on China, you can declare war on the Dutch East Indies, you can declare war on the Commonwealth, FEC and Anzac, you can declare war on the Americans, you can literally declare war on anybody you want. It does not matter. Now, that's not to say there aren't repercussions for your actions. Every time you declare war on somebody, the allied peacetime income is going to go up. Um, now, it, it varies. So China is going to be relatively cheap compared to declaring war on the Dutch East Indies or some other neutral. And obviously, if you declare war on the Commonwealth or America, they go straight up to their wartime economy, which is a concept that I'm going to discuss in more detail in the Allied and Common Turn videos. But just know that if you declare war on the Commonwealth or the Americans, they get a ton of money and they're going to fight back. In terms of lend-lease, the Japanese can lend-lease to anybody at war with a major power in the game. Now, Japan doesn't lend-lease very often. I've found, but for example, if, say, the Far East Command and the British Commonwealth declared war on the CCP if they got really strong, then Japan could lend lease to the CCP now because they're at war with a major power. And the only diplomatic scenario that Japan has to keep track of is going to be down here in Siam. In July of 1939, Siam fully aligns to Japan. And so you replace all these units with Japanese units and you adjust your income accordingly. You'll go up one IPP per turn. And that is all that Japan has to worry about. So that's that, Japan's pretty easy. Let's move on to Italy. Okay, starting here with the Italian reference sheet. Again, note that Italy starts at its full income, so don't worry about that. They just start at 10, and that's all they have. As opposed to the Japanese, they have no peacetime income, so don't worry about the Americans or anything. Again, read all this information. It is super, super important. And obviously, these are the most important things in the game, the victory points. Read about those. In terms of Italian unique units, there's only this guy, 
the Colonial Infantry, which is basically, for all intents and purposes, an infantry that can just be built outside of home country uh, without a factory, and he costs one extra dollar. All right, now I'm gonna quickly go over the highlights on the board. Okay, diplomatically speaking, Italy starts only at war with Abyssinia down here in Africa. And that is going to be an important part of Italian strategy. Um, other than that, they start at peace with the rest of the board. Italy can declare war on anybody in the game, much like the Japanese, except for the Germans and the Japanese. They cannot declare war on their allies. Other than that, any neutrals or major powers are fair game. Again, much like Japan, Italy can lend lease to anybody at war with a major power, as well as the Spanish nationalists, which is going to be very important because the Italians earn a victory point if the nationalists win the Spanish Civil War. So it's going to be important for the Italians to get some troops into Spain via Lindley's. Another objective that is worth a victory point is going to be down here in Abyssinia. I should stipulate that it's potentially worth a victory point if you recall to the reference sheet. Italy gets up to two victory points for each land zone it owns at the end of the game that it did not own at the start of the game. So, regardless of IPP value, so that includes Abyssinia, if the Italians can win the Abyssinian War. So keep that in mind. Also, if the Abyssinians win the Abyssinia War, this Abyssinia will align to France after the fall of Paris. So it's going to be very important probably to the French to win the Abyssinian War and therefore it should probably be pretty important for the Italians to win the Abyssinian Civil War. Keep in mind one thing that is often overlooked is that while Italy is at peace with Great Britain, these planes in Northern Africa cannot fly over British territories to get to Eritrea and assist in Abyssinia. So they can't go through the Suez Canal because this is a British territory technically. So the only way to get these planes from Northern Africa to Eritrea or this fire from Eritrea up to Northern Africa is to be to load them onto an aircraft carrier and drive them through the Suez Canal on that aircraft carrier. There's no other way to get them through there until you're at war with the Commonwealth. So in short, if the Italians can win the Abyssinian War and take Abyssinia and hold it until the end of the game, Abyssinia is worth a victory point for the Italians. Also, it keeps the French from having a guaranteed location after the fall of Paris. Another Italian move will be to annex Albania up here. Now there are no units up here, so you're literally just moving a unit in here and it becomes Italian. And while that seems menial and boring, it is kind of boring, but it is not menial because, as I mentioned, every territory that Italy has in the game that it didn't start with is a victory point. So, annexing Albania for free, getting no units out of it, but you potentially get a victory point at the end of the game if you retain Albania all the way through the end of the game. And that is just about it for Italy. You can then lease the Spanish Civil War, which is important. You have a war going on in Abyssinia, which is important, but also hard to reinforce. So you want to end it pretty quickly. And then lastly, you can annex Albania and potentially get a victory point for the end of the game. All right, let's move on to Germany. Okay, moving on to Germany. Now, Germany is going to have a little bit more going on than the other Axis powers, but again, not too much compared to the other major powers. As you can quickly see, just like our other Axis powers, you start with your full income, and then moving on down, these annexations are going to be important. I'll get to those in a second. You can sign the molotov ribbentrop Pact with Russia, which I'm going to let you read about yourself because it, it'll get boring if I just sit there and talk through it all. Now this section right here, your special minor power alignment conditions, those are gonna be very, very important for you to not mess up because I have had a game where we messed these up and it was really, really bad for Germany. So I'm gonna talk about those uh, a little bit later. Vichy is also gonna be super important and I will also talk about that 
that's gonna be a, a very, very big turn in the game. Now up next, we've got these German special abilities. These are both gonna be very, very important to you, so read these very carefully. Uh, this is gonna be really good for taking France, and this is obviously gonna be good, a good first attack against the Soviets. Now keep in mind that if the Soviets declare war on you before you declare war on the Soviets, you do not get your Soviet surprise attack. This last line right here describes that. So keep that in mind and be careful with that. Also, this technological superiority is awesome for Germany. They get one free tech roll per turn. And also they can buy medium armor and mechanized infantry two turns before everybody else, which is gonna be super important for their first round of attacks. And finally, you've got a ton of wartime bonus income. So keep track of those uh, very, very carefully. In terms of unique units, Germany has a couple of really, really good ones. First off, they've got these SS Pinzer Grenadiers, which are gonna be a mechanized infantry unit, so they're vehicle class, except instead of pairing with tanks to blitz, Panzer Grenadiers can just blitz on their own without tanks, which is a really, really good ability. You get these after you get advanced mechanized infantry. Now, the Germans also have a special heavy armor, uh, which the only difference is it target selects at one to three instead of just one like other major powers heavy armor. Okay, and much more similar to the other Axis powers, Germany starts the game at peace with everybody, but can declare war on any power in the game. So all of these neutrals in Central Europe, Germany can declare war on them. Netherlands and Belgium, Germany can declare war on them. France, the Commonwealth, anybody that is on this board, Germany can declare war on. In terms of lend lease, Germany can lend lease to any, any nation at war with a major power, as well as Vichy France, when it exists, I'll talk about that in a second, and the Spanish Nationalists, which is, good, which is gonna be important for the Germans, because if the Nationalists win the Civil War, that's a, that's a victory point for Germany. In terms of other diplomatic relations, starting in 1936, Germany can annex once per turn each of Austria, Bohemia, and Slovakia here. That's going to be important early game to get some extra income as well as to get those units in there because those become German after annexation. Keep in mind though that just like the other two Axis powers, every time Germany interacts with another power, it's going to raise the income of France, the Commonwealth, and sometimes the U.S. So, for example, anytime you annex one of Austria, Bohemia, or Slovakia, French income is going to go back up by one, and United Kingdom income is going to go up by one. So keep that in mind. And anytime you declare war on a neutral, for example, for example, Poland, the Netherlands, or Belgium, French and British income is going to go up by 2d12. And in terms of special alignment conditions, just like how Italy can annex Albania and how Japan annexes Siam, Germany has a whole chart in the rule book here on page 23, as you can see. So Bulgaria, Hungary, and Ro Romania uh, can be aligned once per turn after France falls. That's gonna be super, super important for you. Um, the first time I ever played this game, we didn't realize that. So the German player actually invaded Hungary, Romania, and Bulgaria. And so as you can imagine, that put them way behind against the Russians and it was it was kind of a cluster, so don't do what we did. Remember that there is an entire chart here of special alignment conditions for the Germans. And of course, here at the bottom is Siam for the Japanese. Now, a lot of these can come in very useful. For example, Turkey, Finland, and Iraq can all be really, really useful for you. So make sure to keep an eye on these as the game progresses to see if it can affect some of the moves you make. One thing that is unique about the Germans uh, with regards to the other Axis powers is any time the Allies or the Comintern declare war on a neutral, that neutral becomes a controlled minor of Germany. Unless Germany is already at war with that major power, in which case the neutral aligns to Germany. So any neutral power on this board, for example, uh, the Baltic States up here, Poland, I already mentioned Iran at the beginning of the game, Iraq, Turkey. Anytime a major power de declares war on their neutrals, they either align or become co controlled minors of Germany. 
Okay, real quickly to finish up here, we're going to talk about Vichy France. So once Paris falls, the Germans have an opportunity to create a controlled minor, if you remember that term, good for you, uh, called Vichy France, which is going to be based here in southern France and Corsica. Now Vichy France is going to act just like any other controlled minor throughout the game. They're going to get a recruitment role every turn because they have two controlled territories being southern France here and Corsica. And then also they, they are at war with the Free French so they can attack the Free French on their attack moves during the German turn as well as receive lend lease from the Germans here in southern France. One minor difference between a controlled minor and Vichy France, France is that Germany is going to receive income for Vichy French territories. Uh, for example, southern France is always going to be Vichy, so Germany will always have at least one extra dollar of income from the Vichy French. And once Vichy French has been created, the German player will roll for every single French territory. Now, some of them are bunched up according to this chart, uh, so you can roll for all of them in groups, uh, like so. And if a certain territory isn't found on this chart right here, for example, Morocco, Tunisia, and Syria, those will be rolled for on a case-by-case -case basis. Other than that, for example, Algeria are all going to be taken care of on the same roll. Now these rolls are going to be 50-50. Either it goes to Vichy France or it goes to Free France. In addition, you are going to roll for each French boat. So all these kind of takes a while if you guys were wondering. And you're going to follow these charts here to decide who that ship belongs to. If ever you have any questions about Vichy France, this reference sheet is gonna be an awesome tool for you. Basically, you just follow it word for word to figure out whose units go to who, and then that's about it. Vichy is, is from that point on just a controlled miner of, of Germany, as I've described before. Except, the only exception is that Germany gets income from Vichy territories and Vichy recruitment roles are only affected by southern France and Corsica. And that's about it for the Axis, guys. We've got some difficult topics coming up uh, in terms of peacetime income increases for the Allied Powers and the Common Turn players. So stay tuned for those two videos. See you guys later.